Good morning. Today we will continue our series on Embrace Transformation. But before we get into that, I just want to talk to you a little bit about what's going to be going on later this summer. In the month of July and August, we will be looking at a new series called Embrace Our Speaking God. Now, you might have noticed through the summer we're doing the campus days where in June we're in Caldwell uh, working on the building there and in July Hutchison campus and then in August at the Eureka campus. Well, during the months of July and August, as we do this series, Embrace Our Speaking God, all the staff will be rotating and preaching messages that are birthed from their quiet time, their secret place, their uh, getting in their prayer closet, spending time with God. What is God speaking to them personally? And out of that time with the Lord, they will bring messages. We want to model the fact that God wants to speak to us, just as we talked about last week, as we get alone with our God and have those devotional times and seek his face, he will speak to us. And you'll hear messages birthed out of those times as we rotate through and share with you what is on our hearts. So we will look in July and August, messages called Embracing Our Speaking God as He Will Speak to Our Lives. And then at the end of the summer on September the 1st, Labor Day Sunday, we will gather together as campuses at Wheat State Retreat Center and have a combined campus service and meal together at Wheat State Retreat Center on September 1st. So we're looking forward to what God is going to do. We'll finish up transformation in the month of June and then July and August start this next series and then end it in September, the first Sunday, by going together at Wheat State Retreat Center. So put that on your calendar. Plan on that, working together this summer and watching as God continues to speak to us. Let's go to Romans 12, 1 and 2 and continue today our series on Embrace Transformation. Romans 12, 1 and 2 again. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Again, from the New King James, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word. It is inspired and errant and infallible. And as we look at it today, we are grateful that you are speaking to our lives. You are challenging us and changing us. Again, as we always pray and we believe that you will give us ears to hear and hearts to apply. And every week we want to ask you to make us good soil. That the seed of your word go deep into our heart and bring forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, transformed into a new person by changing the way you think transformed by renewing our mind. Remember the goal of this series. We know that we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the life change that God does in us when we encounter the wonderful love of God, repent of our sin, and experience Jesus Christ. But Paul says there's a greater work that he wants to do even after that. The greater work is to continue to transform us by the Spirit of God who is within us and deal with our sin nature. Deal with our mind that the Scripture says in Romans 8 is at enmity or hostile toward the ways and will of God. And the Spirit of God rises up in us and begins to take over those areas of our life, changing our minds so that we can live in a life that's filled with the peace and life of God that Paul will tell us is a, a transforming act and Jesus will tell us is an abundant life and a life where we truly can experience his life. As we've walked through this series and we have every week, let's define the words again that we're looking at. The word transform in the Greek, metamorpho, to change into another form. So God says, I'm taking your mind 
And I'm transforming you into another form by changing your mind. Metamorpho, where we get our word metamorphosis. Metamorphosis in the, the Webster's change of physical form, structure, or substance, especially by supernatural means. Changing what? Our mind. Here's the word mind. In the Greek, it means speaking generally the seat of reflective consciousness, comprising the faculties of perception or understanding, and those of feeling, judging, and determining. As we've said every week, the mind in the Greek, in the New Testament, and in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, the mind is the heart, the center of being. Mind and heart are pretty much synonymous terms. The center of the being, where we make decisions, where we get our perceptions, our understanding, our determinations, how we judge things and how we feel. Now, as we've done this, we've looked at the teachings of Jesus where he lays the groundwork by challenging us to renew our minds and live a transformed life. And he does that at the beginning of his ministry, a few months in, and we looked at, we've looked at Matthew 5, 6, and 7, three chapters that are called the Sermon on the Mount. Three chapters that lay out transformative living based on kingdom thinking. Now, remember the, the time and location Jesus is sharing this message, like we have said. It's a few months, probably four to five months into his ministry, and he looks at very clear attitudes and actions that are contrary to the will of God because he's dealing with a religious system, a religious culture that's very self-centered. He's dealing with a Roman culture in the world that's very greedy and immoral. So into that mix, Jesus will teach these three chapters. He will say, this is the way to think. And it's contrary to the way you've thought in the past. And it's contrary to the religious system and how it's telling you to think now. Why? Because he wants to bring transformative truth to those who are his followers. So today we want to go to Matthew, the sixth chapter, where we're at in this series, verse 19. Matthew six nineteen. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there's the desires of your heart will also be. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light, you th the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't worry or make they don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat or what will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Now, there's a lot here in what we read through this portion of Scripture. As we read it, we can also see that Jesus is, again, like we said last week, changing the format. In the fifth chapter, he's referred back to the law and understanding that he didn't come to abolish it, but rather enhance it with the teachings of the Spirit of God to bring out the wisdom and he's used phrases like you have heard the ancestors say or our law says. As he got into the sixth chapter, we looked at it last week, he's taken away the relational blockage. And he has said in this chapter alone, ten times, he's referred to God as Father. 
Father. Only one time in Matthew 5 when he's using the comparison of our character and God's character. But now he said, I want you to turn a relational corner. And I want you to realize God desires to have a relationship with you. And we walked through that last week as we looked at the Lord's Prayer. And now we come to this portion of Scripture and we find this wonderful realization that God's kingdom is a place in this world that we can live in with a kingdom mindset. And he says, I'm going to show you how to not allow the culture around you to dictate your thinking and then dictate your behaviors. He said, I'm going to ask you to have courage to live according to the word and will and ways of God. And that's what this portion that we've read today is all about. He's asking us to take a courageous step of faith to carry out kingdom thinking. So here's the mind-changing words of truth today. Two mind-changing thoughts today that we want to focus on as we've looked at this scripture. Number one, an eternal focus will produce eternal treasure. An eternal focus will produce an eternal treasure. Now, again, remember, Jesus is dealing directly with a religious system that is all about an outward look and not about inward character. Outward look is more important than inward character, and that's the culture that he's working in, in the religious culture. Wealth and status are far above and far, above and far more important than humility and service. I'll say that again so we get it. Wealth and status were far more important in the religious system he's dealing with than humility and service. So therefore, the greater your wealth, the more righteous you appeared. The sect of the Sadducees, which were part of these religious leaders, Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians, all these different sects of people, the Sadducees had actually mixed the law of God with the aristocracy of Rome. So they were playing both sides and trying to gain political favor with Rome and trying to gain religious status at the same time. So they accumulated a lot of wealth. And as they accumulated the wealth, they equated that to their righteousness. And they flaunted their wealth. And they flaunted their status. And they tried to hide their wicked hearts behind religious garb. So they, they lived in this essence of hypocrisy that Jesus is talking about. So Jesus, first of all, deals with that line of thinking by dealing with the wealth of this earth. And he explains right off that the wealth of this earth is temporary. It's temporary. And how does he explain that? He explains it by saying it has no lasting effect. He says, you can gain all the wealth of this world, but moths can eat it all away. Rust can destroy it. In fact, he says, thieves can come in and steal it from you. And then he says, but eternal treasure is stored in heaven. When we give to God, when we give of our time, our talent, our treasure, that's all stored in heaven. And he says, nothing can destroy that. No one can steal that reward. And so he makes that clear distinction that an eternal focus will produce an eternal treasure. But then Jesus goes to the very heart of the matter. He goes to the center of our being. He goes to the real motive, the real intent. And he challenges the thinking of that moment, and he's looking at us today, and he's challenging this simple thought. And he asks us this question just as he's asking them. What are you and I investing in? What are we invested in? Are we eternally focused, or are we temporarily focused? How are we focused? Now, we need to get this, so write this down. Our place of focus reveals the desires of our heart. Our heart position is revealed by our treasure investment. Where we invest our time, where we invest our treasure, where we invest our life reveals, reveals our heart position. It reveals what we really desire and what we really want. So it's important to note that Jesus isn't asking us to not have possessions. He's not asking us to not have money. What he's simply asking us is to change the way we think of it, to think eternal with what he has blessed us with before we think of the temporal or the natural, to think eternal first. And, and I think it's amazing here because God knows something, and it's very important that we understand what he knows, and because it's what Jesus is going to address 
God knows that the most difficult area of a person's life to get them to think eternal is with the provision that they've been given. Because it's easy to become selfish when we have stuff. When we have obtained provision, it's easy to become selfish. And it's like God knows that, so it's exactly what Jesus addresses. Jesus will say, the stuff that we obtain will decay. The stuff that we have obtained will get destroyed. The stuff that we have can and will sometimes get stolen. So he says selfishness will leave us always empty. It will leave us empty because there isn't really any fulfillment in the temporary. There might be happiness for a little bit, but there's not real deep fulfillment. And that becomes the theme of Jesus' ministry, changing the way we think so that we learn to invest eternally with a heart focused on the kingdom of God and not our own kingdom or the kingdom of this earth. In fact, look at Luke, the 12th chapter. Jesus is dealing with a conflict that's come up. And if you've ever been around families like I have that deal with inheritances or things that take place after someone has died, this conflict is very much alive today. It's, it's, it's not just here during this time. It's very much alive today. Look at Luke 12, verse 13. Jesus is invited into a conflict. Verse 13, someone called from the crowd. Called from the crowd. There goes Jesus by. He's teaching. Someone yells from the crowd, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Now, Understand that if a man yells this out of a crowd, we have a serious family conflict going on here. This isn't just one of those, ah, well, you know, he got five bucks instead of me. We have a serious family conflict. This man is calling out to Jesus and saying, you're a great rabbi, you're a great teacher, everyone's following you. What do you think is the first thing on this man's mind? The first thing, the thing he thinks about all the time, the thing that's tormenting him is, my brother is cheating me. Tell him, tell my brother to divide our father's inheritance. Look what Jesus says. Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as this, as that. Then he said, look what he says. Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Life is not measured by how much you own. Some versions will say your life does not consist of what you possess. That's how it reads in the King James. Your life does not consist of what you possess. Luke, the 16th chapter, Jesus will deal again with this investment thought pattern. In verse 10 of Luke 16, if you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, there it is, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven. If you're not faithful with other people's things, why would you, should you be trusted with, with things of your own? So he says, here is the, here's the bottom line. Jesus says, faithful stewardship dictates a greater blessing. And he says, but if you can't be faithful with what I'm giving you, how can you be trusted? How can you be trusted with eternal treasure? He said, I need you, what Jesus is saying, I need you to transform the way you think. Now, the Apostle Paul is going to keep this renewed mind thought pattern throughout the New Testament. He will teach numerous times on it, but one that we're very familiar with it. He's going to share advice to his son in the faith, Timothy. And he's going to go exactly to what Jesus is talking about. Eternal investment mindset. Look what he says in 1 Timothy 6. A very familiar scripture that we've heard numerous times. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people, craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. He says, godliness with contentment, that itself is great wealth. 
But he says, if I chase after worldly wealth, I will pierce myself through with what? Sorrows, many sorrows. But Jesus, he's going to take it a step further if you go back to Matthew, the sixth chapter. He's going to give us the root of why covetousness can easily rule the heart of people and how it can easily rule our heart. He brings out something that we all know, but so many times we fail to bring into the equation. We all know this, but we fail to bring it into the equation. And that is that our minds... Our minds can be focused on the, on the temporal so easily and miss the eternal. And why? Jesus brings out the problem of the unhealthy eye. Here's what he says. He says to us basically this. Write it down. He says the unhealthy eye brings darkness to the whole body. It awakens the carnal nature. It awakens the sinful flesh and sends the mind into a thought pattern that's totally contrary to the Holy Spirit and his desires. Let's read that again. Let's think that through. The unhealthy eye brings darkness to the whole body. It awakens the carnal nature. It awakens the sinful flesh and sends the mind into a thought pattern that's totally contrary to the Holy Spirit and his desires. So Jesus says, while I'm teaching you on this, I want you to understand something. It begins with what I see. It begins. Now, we all know that because we see all the stuff on social media. We see all the stuff on our television. We see all of the advertising that does what? Feeds into our eye. So we will see it. And so Jesus says, I want to take you all the way back to where the sin nature of man was actually awakened. How? It was awakened through deceptive words and a darkened eye. Where do we find that? Oh, we find it in Genesis, the third chapter. Genesis, the third chapter, verse 1. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Well, she's already changed it a little bit. He didn't say you couldn't touch it. He just said you couldn't eat. So already things have began to be manipulated a little bit. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that what? Your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced, watch this, she saw, there it is, that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it, and she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. And what happens? At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Their eyes, they saw it. It looked delicious. Their eyes were opened. Suddenly, they felt shame. See, the eyes focused on the natural pleasure of this world brought about something amazing, brought about instant shame. Isn't that amazing? What appeared to be the treasure of their life and what can appear to be the treasure of my life, if I throw away the eternal treasure, I become bound up by the natural treasure. I want to become the person who says, I'm not bound. I'm not bound in the natural pleasures of life, but I have focused my eternal eyes upon him. And I'm amazed that what appears to be the treasure I want becomes the eternal problem that I don't want. See, that's exactly what covetousness does. Write this down. Covetousness robs us of the eternal treasure we are experiencing and convinces our minds of a temporary treasure that will lead us away and cause us shame. Covetousness robs us. They were in a garden. They had everything they needed. They were robbed of that eternal treasure they were experiencing. Why? Because covetousness robbed them and convinced their mind through the power of the enemy's enticement Convince their mind that a temporary treasure was better, but it's going to lead them away and cause shame. And Jesus brings it all together here. 
altogether. And he says, the treasure of my life is based upon eternal investment, not the investment of my sinful nature. That's only going to lead to death and cause destruction in my life. So he brings it to a head when he says, no one can serve two masters. You'll hate the one and love the other. You can't serve God and be enslaved to money. So he says, change the way you think. Keep your eyes focused and your heart pure. Kingdom thinking means correct heart position. Kingdom thinking says, I'm going to have an eternal focus where my treasure is laid up, where it can never be destroyed. And God, thank you for the provision that I have in this life. Thank you for blessing me. Now let me make eternal investment with what you have blessed me with. Because everything of this world is going to rust, fall apart, or get stolen. In my life, in you, I have treasure that can never be stolen, never rust, and never fade away. Number two, understanding our value eliminates fear and worry. Now, the whole Sermon on the Mount, as we've read through it so far, as the whole Sermon on the Mount will tell us, God wants us to understand at the core is value for others. We've talked about this already. That's why he will say to us, love those who hurt you. Pray for those who despitefully use you and wrongfully take advantage of you. Pray for those who seek to have vengeance on you. And he will say to us, don't walk in vengeance. Don't walk in bitterness. Now Jesus, now Jesus does something amazing. He brings it to us personally because he goes right to the heart of where our fears and worries come from and why they exist so frequently in our minds. Now, I know that all of us understand this, but let's get a dose of this. In our current culture today, in our current culture, any studies that you do, any reading that you will find, you're going to find this. Fear, worry, anxiety, and depression are constantly being talked about. They're talked about in commercials. They're talked about in medications to deal with fear, worry, anxiety, and depression. They're constantly talked about. There are areas of mental health that are frequently talked about, and they are brought to the forefront. They are tormenting the minds of people in the secular culture and the church culture. And Jesus talks about them. And he talks about them in the day of his culture, and it's like he shoots an arrow forward a couple thousand years and says, you're going to be there as well. He deals with something that we deal with today and was dealt with there. But yet, yet, he doesn't deal with it in the same light that we are used to having it dealt with. But he says this has always been a struggle of believers. Because he knows that we're dealing with a sin nature that seeks to rule the mind. Understand that. He's, he's dealing with it from the spiritual aspect. Because he knows that we have a sin nature that seeks to rule the mind and therefore torment the people of God. And he knows that we have an enemy that's ready to entice and manipulate that sin nature to confuse our mind. And so he's dealing with anxiety, fear, worry, depression. He's dealing with all of that with what he's going to say here right now because he understands that's the struggle of believers whose minds the enemy will seek to torment and entice. So Jesus says, don't worry about everyday life. And what does he say everyday life consists of? Food, drink, and clothing. He literally names them. And then he says, he says this amazingly. He says, I want to show you an illustration. Look at the birds. Now, why? He said, why go out and look at the birds? Because he said, they don't plant, they don't harvest, they don't store up, yet... Your heavenly Father feeds them. And you, you, he says, aren't you a more valued? Aren't you more valuable to him than they are? What's he say in Matthew, the 10th chapter? Just a few chapters later, Jesus will say these words in Matthew 10, 29. What is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin. But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. There it is. Don't walk in fear. 
you're more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. See, our fears, our worries are rooted in the fact that we don't see our value to God. We don't understand our value to God. We can rehash. Now, I, want, I, will, I really want us to get this to, this morning. Listen closely to this. We can rehash every failure. We can relive every ounce of shame. But somehow we forget the value that God places on us. Our minds are, aren't renewed with the thought of God's value. They are trapped instead in the prison of poor performance and past failures. Let me repeat that. We can rehash every failure. We can relive every bit of shame. But we forget the value that God places on us. Our minds aren't renewed with the thoughts of God's value. They are trapped in the prison of poor performance and past failures. Somehow we forget these precious words. Psalm 139, 13 through 18. Psalm 139, 13 through 18 you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw my, me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Oh, how precious, precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Please note verse 17 and 18. Precious are your thoughts about me, God. They cannot be numbered. And then even though, even though we are formed, and even though God is the one who makes us and brings us we still flaw that, don't we? And so we have a life that's been flawed and frayed. We have a life that, that because of our own choosing, we've done some things that have frayed our life. And then God says, I need you to know something. First Corinthians, the sixth chapter, 19 and 20. Don't you realize your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? He said, so I'll redeem you, I'll make you new. You don't belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. He says, I need you to understand a wow moment. Yeah, you've been flawed and frayed by this world. The, the sin nature rose up in you and did things contrary to the will of God. But I purchased you. I paid the top price for you. The blood of Jesus Christ was shed for you. And then what does God say in Ephesians, the second chapter, right after he said that God brought us out of darkness and into a light, right after he said, by grace, you've been saved. He says these words in Ephesians 2.10, we are God's masterpiece, God's workmanship, some versions say. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We are created anew. We are a masterpiece. Value. Value. But I love this in Matthew 6. I have read this chapter numerous times in my life. I mean numerous times. <clears throat> but I'm amazed at something that I had never seen before. Jesus doesn't stop there. He repeats himself. Now, why would he repeat himself? Because he knows our minds. And he knows how easily our minds are invaded by our sin nature. And he knows that we continue to fight against this whole thought that we are valued by God. And we are of value to him. So in verse 25, he said, that's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. And what's he do? He goes down to verse 28, just three verses later and says, so why worry? Why worry? Worry. And then he's going to give us another illustration. He'll say, you've looked at the birds. Now look at the lilies of the field. They don't work. They don't make their clothes. Yet they are beautiful. In fact, Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. Now why? 
Why does he say it again? Because he understands that cares, and he cares so wonderfully because he says here, I care. Now, it's so powerful. Verse 30, if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and they're gone tomorrow, in fact, he will say that they're picked up and thrown into the furnace. He's certainly going to care for you. He's going to place value on you. He cares about you. And sitting in that audience that day is the Apostle Peter, who years later will write these words in 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast your cares upon him. Because why? Because he cares for you. He cares. He gives you great value, and then he cares. Value. But amazingly, Jesus doesn't stop there. He repeats himself again, a third time. Why? Because he knows our minds are so easily invaded by worry and fear and anxiety. So he said it in verse 25. He said it in verse 28. And now look what he does in verse 31. So don't worry. A third time he says it. Don't worry. We take God's word when he says it once. But Jesus has said it three times. And what's he saying the third time? Don't worry about these things. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to have for clothing. And instead of another illustration, he's told us to look at the birds, look at the, the, the lilies. Now he says, no, I want you to not worry because you have a covenant with God. You are one of his children. And then he says this, the unbelievers, they have a reason for their minds to be dominated by these thoughts. They have a reason. They're not in covenant with me. He says, they, they do, it dominates their thoughts. They're unbelievers. But he said, your father, get this, there's a great answer, a wonderful answer. Your father, your heavenly father, your most valued relationship, your most valued relationship, your greatest treasure, your eternal treasure, he already knows all you need. So Jesus says, I need you to change the way you think. I need you to let, let your mind be filled with the beauty of God's loving care for you. Now notice here, God isn't excusing wrong behavior. Jesus isn't pushing aside his holiness. He's simply saying, I am a caring, loving God. And I tell my children, not once, not twice, but three times, don't worry. Don't fear. Don't live in anxiety. I value you. I care for you. So replace fear, anxiety, and worry with value and care. Change the way you think. Your mind and my mind doesn't have to be tormented. Instead, it can be refreshed. It can be alive knowing that God cares for us. And then Jesus says, I want to tell you the one thing you need to do in order to keep your mind renewed in this arena. The one thing you need to do so that your heart position is on the eternal so that your value is founded in who God is. He says, here it is. I need you to seek the kingdom of God above all else. Chapter 6, verse 33. The verse that many of us maybe have memorized. Seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. Maybe that's the verse we've memorized for years. It's the one out of this chapter that I have taken into my heart for years. But now I understand it in the context. Now it means more to me. Because when he says, seek the kingdom above all else and then live righteously, I'm reminded that he told me in the fifth chapter, if my righteousness does not exceed that of the, of the religious leaders, it's worth nothing. And now he's just told me how to live righteously. He's told me, if I can understand the wonder of the relationship that he has with me, that he cares about me, that he values me, then I can 
let my life flow into him. I can begin to think according to the scriptures and according to his word, his will, his way. The spirit of God can rise up within me. I can bring forth righteousness and I will understand something. He will give me everything I need. Just simply, he said, let God's kingdom be your passion. Let it rise above all else in your life, above what he talked about, status, above riches, what he just talked about, above all else in your life, above your fears, above your worries. Everything, he says, will be taken care of. Why? Because God values you. And isn't it amazing that Jesus will start this whole thought that we read today about telling us that where our heart is, that's where our treasure is. And then he will end it by telling us how much God treasures us. How much God treasures us. Change the way we think. The sinful flesh and enemy has filled our minds with all kinds of reasons and thoughts that tell us we are worthless. Hear me. The enemy and our sinful flesh has filled us with all kinds of reasons and thoughts as to why we are worthless. And Jesus steps into that fray. He steps into that flawed thinking and he says, you have a heavenly father who sent his only begotten son to redeem you. A father who created you, who knows you by name. And he says, I need you to know today you are valued by God He has placed his care upon you, and if you will seek him first and seek his kingdom, you can be greatly secure in his love for you. And then, I love this, Jesus says, I've told you three times, if that's not enough, I'm going to tell you one more time. Don't even worry about tomorrow. Why? Tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's troubles are enough for today. That's what the 34th verse says. He says, we have enough to overcome today. You have a relationship with God that's fresh today. So he says, seek his kingdom first. He's going to go before me. He will deal with the tomorrow when we get there. Tomorrow, when we arise to seek his kingdom first again, you know what we'll find? We'll find that his mercies are new every morning. We'll find out to give us the grace and the ability to live tomorrow. He said, focus today on my kingdom. Focus today on the fact that I care about you, I love you, and I want to work in your life. And I want you to think this way, not with worry, not with fear, not with anxiety, not with depression. I want you to think along these lines. Seek first his kingdom, and eternal focus will produce eternal treasure. Understanding your value will eliminate your fear and worry, because you are his greatest treasure. And he came and gave his life for you. And he came and gave his life for me so we could walk in the beauty of his faithfulness and his love. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are speaking to us today. Lord, let us live our lives according to your word instead of what we see around us in our culture. You are so faithful to us. We love you. We praise you. Now, God, help us as we lay down the fear and anxieties the thoughts of what are we going to do with this and that. Help us not to serve two masters. Let us focus on you as our master, you as our provider, so that fear and worry do not fill our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you're freeing people today from anxiety. You're setting them free from these tormenting thoughts and giving them a newness in you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Addiction starts to break. To 
Cause I 